Hi, greetings to all. Um, yeah, so this evening's topic, um, this evening's topic on decolonizing speech and accent training. So welcome all to all our guests um, to the conversation. The conversation tonight is a conversation on 21st century strategies for equitable speech and accent training with speech and dialect professionals. Uh, traditional systems of speech and accent training do not cater to all bodies um, in, in contemporary um, acting programs and so forth throughout the country. And tonight we will discuss how we can create an equitable training space for international BIPOC and underrepresented voices in today's training programs. So today I'd I'd like to this evening I would like to introduce our 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 panelists with us this evening. First we have Joy Lancetta Cornell. Joy Cornell is a voice and speech coach who holds an MFA in voice studies from Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, University of London. Joy has served as voice and speech faculty at American Academy of Dramatic Arts, University of Cincinnati College, uh, Conservatory of Music, College of Staten Island, and, and, and internationally has taught at the University of Essex at East 15 Acting School, um, among others. Joy currently serves as a chair of diversity um, of the Diversity Committee of the Voice and Speech Trainers Association. And she's also on faculty at HB Studio. Josh uh, Moser. Uh, Joshua is an actor, voice and dialect coach, and director of and director based in New York City. He has an MFA from Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, other training include City City Company, Valley Taksu, the Power of Clown. Uh, he's a certified assistant teacher of Fitzmaurice voice work and Knight Thompson speech work. Currently, Josh is the interim head of voice and speech for Brown University Trinity, Trinity Rep Company, um, MFA acting and directing programs, and is serving a three-year term on the Fulbright, the Fulbright programs specialist roster, which will include teaching at Tat Bikat Academy in Turkey. And he also has taught at HB Studio. Also on our pan panelists, um, one of our panelists tonight is Jacqueline Springfield. Jacqueline Springfield is an actor, director, and educator specializing in voice, speech, and dialects. She holds a Master of Fine Arts in Acting from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and is a certified and is a certified associate instructor of Fitzmaurice's voice work. She currently is on faculty at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy and has taught at New York Film Academy, Brooklyn College, and Middle Tennessee State University. In addition to her work in film, theater, and television, Jacqueline also performs voiceovers and has appeared in numerous commercials, industrials, and print ads. And also on our panel tonight is Amy Mihyang Ginther. Amy currently is a professor of theater arts at UC Santa, Santa Cruz. She has an MA in voice studies at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London and has coached productions and worked with Aurora Theater Company and Jewel Theater Company, the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London, Drake University. Um, she's a master teacher of acting and singing with archetypes. Her company, Vocal Context, offers vocal coaching, cross-cultural consulting for both companies and individuals. In Seoul, South Korea, uh, Amy has collaborate, collaborated with the Seoul Players, along with conducting workshops with Seoul Shakespeare uh, Company, Seoul City Improv, and some of her corporate clients include AT&T, Samsung, and Hyundai. And, um, and my name, your host for this evening, is Paul Price. I am um, on faculty at, um, at HB Studio. I am their um, director of the Hagen Core Training Program, as well as the Hagen Summer Intensive Program. And I'm also on faculty um, teaching acting at the MFA level at Brooklyn College. So first off, welcome to all of you. 
for being with us this evening. It's a pleasure. Um, and, and I'm really, really excited to, to, to be with you tonight and to, 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 to talk about this very important um, topic. Um, and, you know, just, just preparing this and, and thinking back to my own MFA um, experience, I wish you guys were around back then. And, that, and back then is not that long ago, like seven years ago after graduating from, from school. And, um, so I, I want to I wanna start this off with just um, deconstructing the title of our conversation, um, of our conversation tonight, um, decolonizing um, speech and dialects. And uh, I, I want to and I want to start start off with you, Josh, because um, in our, our earlier conversations, just getting prepared for tonight, you, 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 you really talked about really um, breaking down just that word, decolonizing speech and dialects. So I don't know if you want to start us off with what that means to you and what does that mean? What does that word mean in terms of um, the work that you do as a voice and dialect coach? Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, Josh, uh, they, them. Um, coming to you from Providence, Rhode Island, the ancestral lands of the uh, Narragansett and Wampanoag peoples. Um, so what does decolonizing mean to me um, in terms of my practice, but also like in terms of the, the concept of decolonizing voice and speech training? Um, and feel free, other three of you, to jump in along the way, please. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I want to, I think, firstly, practically bring awareness to the fact that on our panel, we don't have a member of an indigenous nation. So a way to decolonize is um, very practically giving space and power to artists and uh, directors and actors from indigenous communities. Um, people talk about decolonizing the land, but uh, as others have talked about in um, articles, decolonizing bodies is part of that. Decolonizing mindsets. Um, and decolonizing is, is something of a buzzword in, in academic circles, right? It looks really good um, on all of those EDI documents that we spend so many hours mm -hmm. developing, you know, uh, with very specific action points. Um, but if you're not following up and doing really practical things to undo the systemic um, biases and systemic um, structures that have arisen over the last 500 years, um, then you are perpetuating um, colonization. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Josh. Uh, um, Amy, um, I, I think also I would love to hear your 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 thoughts on that. Um, as far as um, deconstructing, how do we go about deconstructing um, biases, prejudices that are um, very much embedded in not just speech and, and uh, uh, not just speech and, and pedagogy of, uh, in theater programs, but just in in the society in which we live. I'm curious about your, your thought process on that. Thank you, Paul. And thank you so much to, uh, to HB Studios for having this event. And I'm always grateful to be in company with these amazing panelists. I'm currently on the land of unceded territory of the Aswaswa speaking Yupi tribe which is also known as Santa Cruz, California. And I want to acknowledge that I am uh, an uninvited guest on this land. And I invite folks who are here and also our panelists to think about what that means and what that feels like in our own bodies, that this isn't just an intellectual thing or a buzzword, that this is a very real material thing to be on land, to be in our bodies. Uh, that, is, that is, it's not abstract and often decolonizing is considered a metaphor or something super abstract. And materialism, when it comes to our bodies and our articulators, right, all of these things, these are very real. And I think as we begin this conversation, to go back to the, the idea that this is very much in relation to education 
and education as a form of colonization or settler colonial power in the US specifically, which is where I am right now. So I'm gonna speak from that place. So there is a legacy of taking folks who identify as Native American, American Indian, Indigenous, putting them, forcing them or incentivizing them to go into schools. And those schools through many types of punishment shut down the languages that they held with their families, their, their ancestry, um, their, their older generations. And so that legacy began so much of what we are still in today and our complicity and perpetuation around accent work, la privileging language, privileging accent. Um, and so there, this was a very intentional way of breaking down and separating and weakening family bond and cultural identity. And, and this is not obviously uh, unique to the US. This is something that um, Ngugi Ta uh, Oengo talked about in decolonizing the mind, going from the bombs to the classroom. Uh, and, and so we need to really start, I think, from that place and the idea of what the colonization and the legacy of colonization really did um, in terms of annihilating, as Ngugi uh, Ta Watyango says, annihilating belief in our names, our languages, our environment, our heritages of our struggle and our unity. So I think that's um, some great things to be thinking about as we're moving forward with this conversation. Thank, thank you, Amy. Um, Jacqueline, um, I, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on, 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 on that. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Lenape people um, who were the inhabitants of this land before colonization. I'm in New York City right now. Um, so originally, um, when Josh and Joy and I were talking about uh, the article, we used the term decolonization um, just to talk about ways in which we could help to guide and structure the voice and speech training of actors in this century. Um, and I think for various reasons, we moved to a title that we felt ultimately was a bit more specific. Um, but decolonization is a strong word. Um, and as Amy said, it's, it's not just about any one particular group of people. Decolonization has happened in a multitude of ways. And I think other than it being a buzzword, the way in which we as professionals who are responsible for the training of young, young actors need to take it into account is by understanding that nothing exists in a vacuum. So if colonization is something that has been, has affected the entire globe, then it makes sense that that's going to trickle down into the way we speak about the way people talk and, and the way in which people express their culture. Um, so it's an important thing for us to understand and not just see it as a buzzword um, and also to not just look at it as something that um, is beyond our scope or that it has it doesn't really have anything to do with what it is that we're teaching in the classroom. It very directly relates to what we are teaching in the classroom, uh, particularly because the training of voice and speech is such a personal thing. And we have to take that into account um, when we're in the classroom with our students. Thank you, um, Jacqueline. Um, Joy, I, I, I want to pass this uh, on to you to get your your uh, your your comments, and also perhaps you can segue that into your own experience in 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 working with actors from diverse backgrounds and how you've seen that manifest in their bodies and in their work, and how um, I know in in your the article that you 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 worked on um, you wrote about um, Asian actors and, 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 and their experience um, coming to different languages or the perceptions um, being placed on them and the expectations of them. Um, perhaps you could segue into that, into a practical example and how that manifests in, into the actor. Sure. Um, ooh, that's a lot. Um, I, I don't know that I have any more to add on the term decolonizing. I think my colleagues did a beautiful job um, addressing that. Um, so, you know, in summary, it's a, it's a very loaded and often misused word. So I think we should, um, for those of us who have used it in the past to, to really 
acknowledge where it came from and to, and to be very intentional about how we use it. Um, in terms of um, working with multilingual international students um, and, and just how, how the work um, affects, uh, ha has affected uh, students in terms of um, being new to this country or, or, um, or speaking and acting and participating in class in a different language. Uh, I think, I don't know, I, I don't even know where to start with that question, but uh, one of the biggest things is I think we, uh, so many schools, especially, um, you know, coming from New York, which um, actually I have to acknowledge that I am um, currently right now in Kentucky on the Shawnee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Osage land, um, but uh, formerly, formerly in New York, um, but that many schools really take pride in, in having international students um, attending their schools. And I think, I don't know that we really consider their needs and um, their experiences. And for, uh, you know, as a voice and speech coach, some of the things that I really run into is this whole idea of accent and this idea of, um, you know, a lot of these students come into class already very scared um, that they are speaking in their second language and already very hyper aware that they sound different from those around them. Um, so it's, it's just, I think what's really important is that faculty members are all on the same page in terms of how we address that. Um, just in my own experience, having, you know, different teachers have a different perspective on the goals of the student's speech versus my goals for as a speech teacher um, of the student's speech is uh, it's very problematic. So I have I had in the past a lot of students come to me saying, um, you know, in acting class, I I I, I keep um, getting comments about my accent. I need to learn how to speak in a general American accent. I'm told I cannot work unless I speak in a general American accent. Um, so. Uh, there is a lot of baggage already with these students as they come into the class. And I think um, we need to spend more time thinking about that experience because a lot of these students leave damaged and a lot of them leave traumatized. I, I, I spoke to an actor who is filming in, in Asia who said she, she, she was panicking because she couldn't um, she didn't feel connected and, and felt like she could act because she was so afraid of how she spoke. And I think we need to think about the impact. If, if, if you are a teacher, I think you need to think about um, what is the cumulative communication that you give to your students. If you're telling them accent work, um, you won't work in, you know, in the industry unless you sound a certain way, and then you cast them in, in minor roles what kind of message are you sending to each student? So I think like really understanding kind of the messages you're sending um, to your students is, is, is really important, but this whole idea of equity, right? Like equity is the need for differing treatment to make the opportunities the same as others. That is what we need to focus on. And in fact, I think a lot of schools are having this DEI initiative, diversity, equity, inclusion. Equity should be first. Equity acknowledges what is happening right now. And diversity, you can bring as many diverse people in your school, but if you're not acknowledging what, what equity you're providing to your students, um, I think that's, that's a really good start. I could go on, but I don't want to yeah. like hijack the conversation. <laughs> yeah, Jackie, I want to um, circle back to you. Um, how, what would you say? Because I know on this on this webinar we have a new, we have numerous um, um, coaches, teachers, um, faculty people that that are looking to to you for you all for 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 guidance, and and we'll we'll keep digging into that. But what would you say to um, teachers who are now confronted? Um, and again, it's all in, all in response to industry. So we have now a swing where you're seeing more diversity, right, in the classroom um, with, but not necessarily with faculty who have experience um, dealing with um, these new cohorts uh, that are coming from many different 
um, cultural backgrounds, right? And and they are and they or are they mean well and are grappling with with how do I how do I serve my class with good intentions, but may not have the tools yet um, to, to to reach them. What what would you say to them um, as as ways of of um, addressing some of the concerns that that Joy um, brought up in terms of communication and the messaging that 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 they send off to them. So um, first of all, I think we have to be mindful that we're going to have to acquire the tools that we don't have. I think particularly as voice and speech trainers, because what we do can be so intellectual. You know, I like lexical sets and IPA as much as the next person, but what else are you educating yourself in to better serve your students in order to honor the whole student as much as you can in the in the um, subject in which you're teaching them. Um, so acquiring as much information as you can and not just saying, well, I don't know anything about that. So I'm, I'm just gonna act like that didn't happen or I'm not going to address it. Um, because the reality is more and more you're having uh, classrooms where there's a high percentage of BIPOC students um, and the teacher will be not BIPOC. Um, so you still have to serve those students. If there are tools that you feel you don't know or that you know for sure you don't have, then it's your job to acquire those so that you can better serve your students. And there's so much, there's a wealth of material, especially now, especially in the last few months, um, that you can access in order to get more information. Um, just like, just as a tiny example, okay, um, I have been working with the Black Student Forum at several different schools where I teach. Um, and one of the things that in terms of voice and speech training, the students have said to me is the way in which they are spoken to uh, in terms of their accent and um, particularly if they are native speakers of African American English. And there's oftentimes this sense of um, condescension or this sense of um, really a, a kind of a mocking that will happen um, rather than giving the student tools that they need to work as an actor, there, there feels like there's a lot of judgment. Um, and there will be even specific things said, for instance, um, you didn't say the TH sound, you didn't, you know, you didn't say that intradental sound, you said F instead, you said with instead of with. Well, if you know, as the teacher, if you've acquired the information that in many West African languages, of which African American English um, has a large basis in, don't have the TH sound, and that's why it gets replaced, just like it does in Cockney, just like it does in a whole bunch of other uh, dialects and subdialects and accents, then you will probably um, approach that student in a much, in a, you'll have more information with which to approach that student. So that what you're doing is giving tools and not, and it, you know, sometimes we are very unaware of the harm that we cause and the trauma that we cause. So the more information that you have, the better, because then you can serve the student and not commit microaggressions that you're totally unaware of, you know? So educating yourself, getting as much information as you can and seeking that information, not just asking other people, but decide that it's something that you wanna do, serve, your, serve all of your students better, serve the broad range of students that you have better and find out what information that you need in order to do that. Um, don't, don't just, don't be afraid of it and don't just decide that it's, your knowledge base is all you know, and that's what you're going to teach from. I think that's what a lot of people have done for so long, but time time is out for that, you know? There's, yeah. there's a huge sea change that we're experiencing. Um, so acquire the information that you need, get the tools that you need so you can pass those on to your students in a way that's not uh, traumatizing and that serves all of your students. Yeah, that, that's really powerful work, and, uh, um, and thank you for that comment. You know, it, it makes me think back um, in all of the years I've been an actor and, and training, I, I don't think I was ever called upon to address or to speak on my Caribbean accents, my French Caribbean um, speech and, and cultural um, uh, history and lineage. 
and Amy, I, I know in the work that you and all of you are, are pioneering, really, um, in terms of bringing um, the cultural, the, 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 the actor's cultural um, um, set as a point of entry and seeing it as, a, as, a, um, as an asset and as a way forward, as a way into the work. Um, 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 I want to I want to put this on, on, over to you, and and in, in the reading and in preparation for our conversation, I, you 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 and your colleagues talk about strategies um, for um, speech co speech coaches and in, in how they can um, uh, address diverse diverse um, uh, of students, diverse actors, namely things like cultural responsiveness cultural responsive teaching, dialogical action, humanizing cultural sensitivity. Um, can, can you speak a little bit to, to those and, and other tools that, that, actor, that teachers and, and, uh, in the field can, can use or, or learn more of and in, in, in incorporating into their, their approach? Uh, thank you for that, Paul. I believe that's from um, Joy, Josh, and Jacqueline's article. So if you want to continue with that question, maybe they would be best to answer that or we can shift to your or, or, I can I can very briefly it was actually my article <laughs> um I can very briefly touch on that because I want um everyone else to to, to speak and this is again just my uh based off of my first um my soul solo article um you mentioned culturally responsive teaching and that's simply to just be aware and sensitive of the cultures that you're interacting with, um, which is being culturally sensitive. Um, for example, just even knowing that if you tell a student, you know, look into my eye when I talk to you, that some cultures will find that horribly uncomfortable. Um, and so really educating yourself on knowing who your students are, like know who you teach, and understand what some of their cultural backgrounds are. So that's culturally responsive teaching. I think that's pretty basic and 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 um, you know pretty straightforward. Um, you mentioned humanizing. Um, this is for accent coaching, and it's simply that because there are so much there's so much stereotyping in accent work is that you really approach the accent um, in a way that humanizes it. That that it's not just sound, but that it's spoken by a real life human being with with a, a history and culture and and um, and that there's a character, there's a person behind that that sound. Um, you know, it, with, a, with a lot of the, the accents that I work with, they're, they're often, you know, historically have been caricaturized and, and stereotyped. And so really using, humanizing, like looking at it through an actor's lens is, um, is helpful. And then dialogical action you mentioned is simply just, dialoguing <laughs> with your students and, and actors to get to know who they are and to really build rapport and trust and understand what their worldviews are because as much as they're your students, they're also your teachers as well. They guide you on how to teach them or coach them. Um, and so those those are the strategies for my articles, but I um, everyone else here has wonderful ways of approaching work as well. Uh, Amy, would you like to, what, what, what are some of the, the thoughts or, or strategies you you might suggest for for our teachers watching sure i mean um and i think i can include tyler's question from the q a and respond to that a little bit here as well i think that um oh, where to begin I, first of all to amplify everything joy and jacqueline just said in those in those responses i i really agree with all of that uh, i think that um, we have this limited amount of time and space for what we can teach our students. And so if you start with an accent that is predominantly white and or upper class and or standard in, in these terms, you are saying that that is the most important thing. And that is, you know, there's so much that goes unsaid in curricular work and it's a value, a curriculum is a value system, a syllabus is a value system. And when we don't have conversations around what is what is on that, because maybe I choose to put a practitioner or a citation or a methodology on there that is predominantly white, but we can have a conversation about it and we can talk about why. And so people are jumping in, like Jacqueline was saying, you know, we have this content, we have our IPA and our lexical sets, but it's about how we teach that work. 
And it's about the questions we ask when we talk about it. So you don't have to start with pulmonics. You don't have to start with English sounds. You can start with adjectives. You know, you can start, um, Josh and I are both certified in Knight Thompson speech work and we do the empty chart, which is an exploration of every sound humans can make. And we talk about how the IPA chart has its own biases hidden within it. Uh, you know, there are some sounds I've tried to transcribe in, from Korean that it's like, oh, but the, the rules of IPA don't work in that way. You're not allowed to put those two things together. And that's because a bunch of white folks figured, decided IPA was going to be in that way, right? And continue to decide what rules apply and don't apply. So all, none of these things are neutral. None of these things, as Jacqueline said, live in a vacuum. Uh, and so I, I was tutoring a student in the UK who was Korean who was, you know, doing RP first, and then from RP learned US American English and then a standard US accent and had a, a, an assessment at the, the same day for both of those accents, but couldn't go from his own accent into the new accents, had to go through RP. And, and that is, that's, that kind of thing is just ridiculous. So to tie that in also with, with Tyler's uh, question about the idea of using our own sounds as um, that turns and feels like tokenism. I respond to that, it resonates with me a lot because I'm a transracial Korean adopted person. So my language around Korean is not from any acquisition. And so if I had a teacher who was like, start talking in Korean, well, I don't speak or I didn't in my undergrad almost any Korean. So that would be a very terrifying for me and cause a lot of anxiety. Uh, and even if I did have some, it's still, it's, it's really complicated. And so I think there's a lot of folks who are joining us today who are saying, yeah, I, I encourage actors to use their, their accents or, or their other languages, but they're not using them, right? And, and how do we, and, and that's deep work. And if you're not using samples of folks and amplifying people in what you're sharing, what materials you're using, if you're not setting a space for folks to feel comfortable to do that, or, you know, we're on Zoom, everyone mute themselves, let's play muted, or we're in a space, let's talk to something that's really close to us so we're not all here, like, we all have to find strategies to create this space, it's not enough to just say, "Okay, you just go in your in your first language, just do this text right now." And that's it's that's not setting up the space that we that we need. And then even worse to be like, "Well, that student didn't take advantage of that, right?" And I tried. It's the work is so much deeper than that. Right, right. Thank you, thank you, uh, Amy, uh, Josh. Um, I wa I wanted to ask you um, about Shakespeare transitioning a little bit about Shakespeare and the classics. You know, we, we, um, you know, we, we, we have this measure that Shakespeare is the bar that makes you um, this great actor, right? That there is this perception of that, at least um, m many folks have. Um, and doing these classics or even more contemporary classics like the Chekhov's, the Ibsen's and so forth, um, that is the measure of you being um, uh, a, a, a trained classical actor, right? Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on that and, and how Shakespeare and classical text has been centered in, 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 in a lot of training programs and um, your thoughts on, 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 on that and, 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 and your response to that. Um, yeah, that, so the um i i want to as i've been listening to everyone talk i, I just want to bring up the um idea of intersectionality right every human has layers of things going on for them and if we're not uh as teachers being aware of that in in our students in front of us we can unintentionally do um harm and a strategy for um, working on the decolonization of the self is remembering to separate your intention from the actual impact it has on the people around you. And so nobody, pardon my language, but nobody gives 
an F about your intentions if the impact is doing nothing but harming people. So, um, and in our own fragility as humans, we tend to forget that. And so when people come to us with ways that they've been harmed in our classrooms, we tend to get very defensive. Um, and then we tend to shut down and not take in the information we need to make active change. And it's not just in our classrooms, this is also, you know, administrative. If, if teachers or students are coming to administrators and saying, this is a problem, this is happening, we need to fix this then you need to use the power available to you to make effective change so that the um, harmful impacts are no longer happening. Um, with rela as, as that relates to the classics, I am, so I am so curious about how we define not just the word classics, but like so many other words, um, like who gets to be a classic playwright? <laughs> And what accents are we allowed to allowed then to use in the classics? And and there's this um, <clears throat> there's this tendency to equate because because of the systems of colonization over the last five hundred years. There's a tendency to equate neutral um, and classic with the standard version of the dialect that you're talking about. And this happens in multiple languages. So this happens in Spanish, this happens in French, this happens in English. Um, and I really want for training programs and for teachers of classical acting um, classes to start thinking about how we bring in texts that do the same thing that Shakespeare does, that were written by a wider array of playwrights to better represent the students in front of us. And taking this to, to accent land, um, as Amy was saying, we are, in, we are KTS certified teachers. So my philosophy about a first semester speech class is that it's open chart, playing with all of the sounds, working from possibility because the goal of a first semester voice and speech class is to start undoing deeply ingrained personal habit to expand actor range and availability of choice. <clears throat> so if they are then in that semester going into a, an acting class and the only notes they're getting from their acting teacher are, you need to change your accent, you have a lisp, you X, Y, Z they're not getting any actionable notes on their acting. They're getting notes on a speech pattern that they are working on, do you know? Um, there are things that acting teachers can teach in text that have nothing to do with the way the sound is being shaped. They can teach relationship. If, and, and I tend to also ask, what about the, the actor's regional dialect or accent is catching your ear? Does the acting teacher need to learn to listen more actively? Does the student need to slow down because of what Joy said? They are so aware that they sound the way they sound. Maybe they're nervous. And so that's causing them to brace and tense and speak really quickly. So getting them to be uh, more clear is as simple sometimes as saying, Stand there, look at your scene partner, breathe in, speak the first line slowly. Instead of saying, fix your accent. You need to take the time with your students and coach them moment by moment to something that is more complete. That is our responsibility as teachers. And if you're not doing that, then uh, you're failing actors and making them think that they can't handle material or that they won't be successful if they can't move into the um, perceived standard. And I, I, <clears throat> I've spoken for a long time, so I wanna wrap up, but I think this relates to what Joy, Joy Jones asked in the, um, <clears throat> in the Q and A here, which is that a, a lot of um, actors because of the way that they've been socialized due to the last 500 years of history, want to target the things that they perceive that the industry wants, right? And so one thing that the industry does sometimes require of us is to speak with a standard American dialect or a general American dialect. Those two things are different um, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> 
but as coaches and teachers in voice and speech classes, and something that I think acting teachers can re-examine, you know, depending on when they were schooled and educated, is that standard American and general American are accents of English the language. They are not the language, right? And so if I am teaching an actor to target that accent, I'm teaching them to acquire that as an accent in their toolkit so that they can code switch into it when they need it, not so that they can live that way at all times. So then by necessity, part of their training has to be, what do they sound like themselves? What are their own oral posture habits? What pitch patterns do they go to naturally in their own idiolect? Because if they don't understand those things, how are they going to be able to one, return home when they're done working and two, effectively shift out of them into target accents without having to do um, the, the thing where they translate themselves into standard and then into the other accent. Actors should be able to move from self into target and then back to self. I am done. That was <laughs> thank like, you. I'm done. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Amy, Amy, why don't you, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, uh, again, agree with everything Josh just said. I wanted to talk about the, the idea of fixing stuff because I have students who reflect on this in their journals and their self-evaluations. And every time I say, you are not broken. If we talk about fixing things, it means something is broken and they are not broken. And their voices and their speech patterns are not broken. And that, and it kind of goes back to what Joy was asking as well in the Q and A, part of it is, is I'm, if you have deliverables for someone who's on a one-on-one and or more corporate settings or quick fix kind of scenarios as opposed to a four-year conservatoire. It's, it's a both and. It's a, I'm going to support you with your goals because this is what you want and the demands of your job or the industry are real. But I'm also going to feed in things that are hopefully in a longer term going to shift some of your ideas around how you need to contort around that, um, around these larger systems. And, and I feel very deeply that our job is to support our students in terms of figuring out ways of loving themselves, their bodies, and their voices a little bit more with my being honored to support them in that journey and the time we have together. Students are not going to shift any habits if they are not more in love with who they are and, and what is so. And to speak about uh, to speak about Shakespeare and the classics, so to speak. So I'm my chapter for for the book I'm editing, which Joy is also Joy Coronel on, on the panel is also a, a chapter writer about decolonizing and anti-racist actor training. Is uh, so I'm working with Shakespeare and how to decolonize Shakespeare, which is a wonderful paradox in in that we should be with, and. Mark Rylance talks about, you know, in when you're performing Shakespeare, it shouldn't be the story about the story. It should allow the words and the, the, the images and the storytelling to be illuminated and, and it's a straight line. But I think what's really, and I do talk about that and hold some space for that. And the stories of our students and their accents and their sounds can, can illuminate things in this work that we consider classic, whatever, that that other folks who did it before them didn't, didn't show that. And when you, you use different sounds to say those words, some of the best Shakespeare acting I've seen was from a Korean actor whose first language was Korean because they were, they were not taking anything for granted in the work. And, and what they had and where they were coming from was a gift to Shakespeare. So he was lucky to have this actor embody his text. And also we as an audience got to see new things from that. So there's just so much potential when we shift how we encounter. And I think a lot about location in terms of, does Shakespeare, do, does Shakespeare demand we go to him or do we meet? Can we meet, can Shakespeare come to us? So there's just so many ways we can teach this work or some of this work and, and how we contextualize it. Yeah, yeah. Would, would you say, um, uh, would you say for, um, teachers who are dealing with, who are working with their students, um, because in, 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 on the, to, to play devil's advocate on the, you know, we, our students leave us, they enter the, the working world, they enter, the, they enter this, 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 the real world of, of, of this industry. 
and, and what governs it. Um, and there are folks who are, who are not speaking this language and, and, and frankly, don't really care on, on one level, right? So how do we, as the teachers, empower? What I'm hearing is empowering um, um, our, our, our students to, to, to be willing to stand, for, stand in who they are and, and, and know that who they are is enough in the face of um, in the face of ignorance, in the face of someone saying no, that is not what we want. But knowing what you offer, what what would you say to students to empower uh, actors going in and and receiving that? Um, how how would you um, re respond to that, um, Jack Jacqueline? If you want to take this first, yeah. Y yes. Um, so when a student is in our classroom we have to be very careful about providing an environment where they can be open and they can be vulnerable, particularly when it comes to voice and speech work. Um, if we allow that to happen in their training, then they are much more equipped when they go out into the industry to um, allow themselves to be open and vulnerable, but also know how to be diplomatic and also know what it is specifically they need to do. Because you may have a director who uh, doesn't have the empathy perhaps that your teacher had. If your teacher has that empathy though, then you're able to defend yourself and conduct yourself in a way where you can handle a director who uh, perhaps doesn't have the language that they need to speak to you in a way where you can, you know, where perhaps that director doesn't have the empathy that your teacher had. But the, the, the empathy has to start in the classroom first as a part of that training. Um, we, we cannot allow the excuse to be, because I've heard people say this, different versions of it. Well, this, isn't, this is how it's going to be in the industry. So, you know, and they, it's all given under this guise of it being tough love when actually it's just a lack of empathy and we still we're, we're training actors empathy is the core of what at the core of what we are training them to be able to to do um so we have to have that kind of empathy and and in the classroom so that they are able to better handle themselves because they are going to come across directors and, and and agents and casting directors who are are not going to um be as mindful about uh, as about things as perhaps their teachers are, but it has to begin with us. You know, it has to begin with us in their training. I I'm just gonna jump in and and just kind of follow up what Jacqueline was saying is that you know we just need to be able to have these conversations. I think um, it's it's and even you know someone who experienced. Um, you know, in my own training, uh, a lack of acknowledgement and who wants to kind of rectify that by providing the opportunity now to my own students, I also find it difficult to talk about, but I think it's very helpful and powerful to acknowledge that to your students in that this is this is hard. This is a hard conversation, but I'm willing to walk this through with you. We don't have to have all of the answers. And I think there's a lot of fear um, in having these types of conversations about race and culture and casting and stereotyping is because there's a fear that they might say something wrong. And I think that there needs to be a little bit of um, grace that I might not have all the answers. I might even say something really wrong, but I'm gonna come back the next class and I'm gonna acknowledge that. Um, and it really starts from having that sense um, the, of, of getting rid of that ego and of being wrong because we're all learning. I mean, this, this whole idea of what we're doing, all of the panels here, we're all learning and researching so that we can, we can do this better. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I see we have a, um, a question here from Jennifer um, Ines. Uh, I'll just read it out. Um, so many flippant um, but damaging comments my students hear about their speech come from acting teachers and visiting directors, many of whom seem not to engage in this discourse. Does the panel have this experience? Do you find yourself undoing such damage? And she's um, writing from Australia, which she feels a little bit behind the, the US in these conversations. Anybody would like to, we've been talking a, a bit about that, but have you been in a situation where a student comes to you and you have to do damage control? Yes. 
that's the short answer. The long answer is uh, that was the impetus uh, specifically for the article that Joy and Jacqueline and I wrote. Um, and the article that we wrote was kind of aimed at acting teachers and directors and casting directors who um, <clears throat> sometimes are more flippant than they should be um, or are giving notes about speech in a way that is really not actionable or, or usable or useful um, and just cause the actor to shrink more. Um, damage control is, is, a, is a big part of um, what I do as a voice and speech teacher. Um, a voice coach, you know, professionally. Amy, you're agreeing with me. <laughs> Well, and also let's just honor for the folks of us here, the additional labor that goes with being a person of color in having those conversations with often white colleagues and, and needing to deal with, and the, the amount of additional labor we have when folks are coming to us who share our identities or we're the only person they feel they can come and, and speak with about these things, right? That's another added dynamic um, to this. Yeah. Um, where, where, where can, where, where can, um, or how can folks on here tonight, um, read, um, the articles that, that, that you, 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 you four have brilliantly written? Is there a way they could re um, access that online? I, what's for the I was going to link, fast. I was going to link in the chat. Okay, great. Okay, good. Yeah, that, that would be, if we could do that, that would be. Good. Um, um, yeah. So so. Yeah. I mean, this 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 is this is like an ongoing um, conversation and an ongoing. Um, and have you found that wherever where you are working and your colleagues, particularly your white colleagues, how how have they been um, receiving um, the article? What has been the the articles that all of you have written? What has been the the response to that? And how have essentially the chairs of various departments been um, incorporating this, if at all, if any, <laughs> into, the, um, into the pedagogy of, your, of, of the institutions that you're, you're working with. What, what, has been, what has been your experience um, in, in the school system um, to this, this new way, this new approach to working, particularly with the older, more established um, uh, classical acting teachers that are that are entrenched in many of these schools. Uh, how have they been receiving your work? Um, I, I would like to speak to that because I'm at several different uh, working in several different programs simultaneously, and in general, two things have happened. One, most faculty and administration are very keen to. Um, try to serve their students better, for the most part. Two, they're not sure how to do it, and there's a lot of defensiveness around when you try to get specific about ways in which they can do that. And that speaks to what I was saying earlier about the word decolonization and how there's some fear and some hesitancy around that. Um, but it, it really, I think, g going back to what was said before, um, in terms of undoing the damage it, within a program, within, you know, within a school, um, we really have to look to our administration to, one, hire more BIPOC faculty, because representation is not just important, it is absolutely necessary. Um, and so what you're going to be doing is not just representing if you have, you know, students of color who um, are in your program, but you're bringing in people who have a lived experience that are going to have some knowledge and some wisdom that is going to better serve all of your students. Um, so it's important that the administration does, you know, brings in faculty, um, not and not just in part time positions, but in full time positions who are able to do that. Um, but the if the administration does that, then the faculty has to follow. It has to start at the top, you know. Um, but I think there's, for the most part, that feeling of, oh, yes, we need to change things. We need to do something. And then the, 
once people start realizing how much work it is and that the work is continual, you can't, this can't just be something that ha happens, you know, for the next couple of weeks. You can't just throw the buzzwords around and, and feel good about it and then go back to what you were doing before. The work is, it, it continues, it is ongoing um, and it's not easy and you have to step outside of yourself in order to do it. That's when I found that people sometimes will start to get um, defensive. So that's the hard part. How do we continue doing the work? Yes, yes. You know, you 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 start talking, you start mentioning words like decolon decolonizing, intersectionality, um, just race in general. People just go, just go blank and 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 get silent, and they're like, no one knows what to say. <laughs> but they right. want to run away from the whole conversation. Yes. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah, that that is that is, that is true. Um, um, yes. So I we're 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 coming up on on time. We have a few more minutes left. Um, and Amy, thank you for sharing those articles for us. Appreciate that. Um, so um, Amy just just um, loaded up in the chat, you will see links to a number of articles that our panelists have, have written um, and pioneering this, this, this work. Um, so I invite you to access that material and, and, and reach out to them to continue um, the conversation and, and, and to um, see how you can make impact wherever you're, you're teaching. Uh, I wanna open it up for, for the four of you for any closing and any parting um, thoughts, um, ideas, comments that you want to leave our our um, our our participants with, um, and, and Amy, I'll start with you. Uh, actually, I'll keep linking. So oh, um, you're linking. Okay. Put me put me into later. <laughs> I'll, I'll put you last. Okay. Um, Joy, how about you? Would you like to Would you like to share any final thoughts? Yeah. Um, <laughs> which one? Um, I don't know. Um, this is a journey and not an end place, um, right? We, we are continually learning. We, there is still so much to learn. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, Josh? Um, yeah, this is, there's not an arrival point. This is an ongoing process within yourself, within um, the places that you work. And um, as has been mentioned previously, to have grace with that, um, to acknowledge that and to be willing to fail and get up again and keep moving forward. Wonderful, thank you, Josh. Uh, Jacqueline? Um, the, you know, the same thing, Be. Um, I think we get so accustomed to knowing things that sometimes we're afraid to ask questions of our students or to admit, you know what, I don't know that, but I'll try and find out. Um, and also recognize there's a sense of urgency here that what we're doing is not just because everybody else is doing it, that there's a real need to change our world and we need to be responsible for doing it in the field that we're working in. It's imperative. Amy? Yeah, oh, Jacqueline, the urgency. Since our civil unrest, the recent chapter of our civil unrest in, in the summer of this year, um, there have been so many uh, Black, Indigenous folks of color coming together, talking about theater practices. And I have seen students on Zoom calls in tears who are in, still in school right now talking about their accent work being um, tra uh, traumatic for them. The stakes are so high. And when we look at folks like Chadwick Boseman or the actor who was in the new Star Wars who has a Mexican accent, whose father saw him and broke down crying to see that representation. I think it's an, and I wanna also the, the idea of questioning things and like how can we model vulnerability Imagine if you have that next student in your class and what interventions are you doing 
to encourage them, to amplify them, to support them, as opposed to being the person and the reason that they chose to give this up. Imagine if some of these incredible actors telling these stories in all these different sounds that they have were were told or or had an obstacle that you could be as a teacher because this happens every day and I don't want to see any more of these black and brown and indigenous students in tears on these on these zoom calls with no one to support them because it is happening they might not be coming to you if they're coming to you that means that they trust you enough to make a difference so thank them for coming to you if they have an issue first and be grateful that they're actually willing to have a conversation with you because for so many of these situations they're not coming to you and they're going somewhere else or ending their dream so we have a grave responsibility in this work and good luck <laughs> <laughs> thank you the, thank you so much amy thank you jacqueline thank you joy and thank you josh for um for for being on this panel and for sharing such a deep insight into the work that you're doing, um, pioneering work, groundbreaking work, really. Um, and thank you for it. Um, I, um, I invite our, our panelists, our, our, our participants, and, and people on this webinar to reach out to, to, to you. I know they could find you, websites, online, social media, um, um, to continue the conversation and, and perhaps find ways that you you can share the knowledge um, that they they could take back into their classrooms into their institutions and 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 disseminate that work and a work that we all need to be doing um, together it's been deeply insightful for me extremely um, um, uh, educational for me and in, in, in my own work as, as an actor and also as 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 as, as a teacher because I'll also say that I think um, you know there 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 are different levels of wokeness too you know so i i and i and i and i and, and we, we we need to acknowledge that even someone maybe bipoc doesn't mean that they woke either do you know <laughs> do you know and i think we're we're we're, we're we've all drunk the kool-aid so we all need to um um we all need to do the work all of us so thank you once again um and uh Thank you, HB. Thank you for, for being a platform to encourage this, these conversations. Thank you to Edith Meeks, our, our fearless um, uh, um, executive director um, and, and, and creative director at, at HB Studio, um, um, our, the Artistic Council, as well as the board of HB Studio. Thank you for being an environment that fosters these conversations and being also at the forefront, the pioneering forefront of, of changing the landscape of American theater. Okay, everybody have a good evening and uh, see you soon.